learning steps per unit yep. time. Yep. So. Great, thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Take care. Good to see you. Thank you for a somewhat uplifting talk. Oh, good. Um, I've got an issue that I'm not sure that you were aware of, the Office of Technology Assessment. Yes. Is your foundation interested in like doing anything to help revive it? Uh, a, a number of my colleagues uh, are, are working on that. Okay. Yeah. I'm, so, I just wanted to bring sure. that one up again. Yeah, yeah. You no, know Reggie work. Brothers. Oh, okay. She worked for Reggie Brothers. Oh, I for Reggie Brothers. Yeah. I'm a Penn alum. So oh, yeah. I was there in DLD. Yeah, absolutely. Laura Stubbs heads our uh, diversity and inclusion. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, good to see you. Yeah. Guys, that's a quick question. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, I am Yoni. I just wanted to thank you. And uh, I did a project for Radiant Earth this summer. Oh, great. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Teachers and uh, yeah. you know, applied to the ATM program. So I'm really inspired by awesome. work in the past and looking forward. And great. Thank you so much. Sure. Absolutely. I actually just had a question about that APM program. Yeah, so I'll give you one example. So we've uh, identified someone who has some really interesting ideas on the intersection of healthcare and machine learning. Uh, so, so that's one that we're looking at. Like, so how, what are the opportunities that are created when we can pool and link data across multiple healthcare institutions? So, so in some cases, we're starting with a person mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, uh, and saying, well, that person has a really good idea, so we're going to bet on them, mm -hmm. and then we might provide them with some APMs uh, to help them with their idea. I see, I see. Yeah. Did you see the best way to get Oh, it? shoot, I, I, left my, I left my phone in there. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you met Dan Roth, right? Yes, yes. AI class. Yes, excuse me. Oh, All right. Thank you. Great talk. Oh, thank you. I've heard good things. I don't think I'm supposed to see you, Your team did a great job on good. pulling everything great set of meetings together. So we'll find, find a way to keep you engaged. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. How long? We have just one hour for lunch. I think you have you have the schedule that's pretty packed. Yeah. 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 Daughter. Daughter. Uh, he's a major in um, computer science. Why? Well, he was just here a second ago. Yeah, I just thought, I, like, I think he's in the lobby. <laughs> I just, we could hear him the whole time. Uh, maybe not. Unless he just gave it to you. But I no, no. Okay, so So the previous speaker still has the mic. Can you hear me there?
Okay, so we'll, we'll do with this until they bring us the real mic. Uh, Okay, and, and we also enjoy today two screens. Uh, so we should have an invited speaker before class every time. Okay, so, um, so I wanna first finish where we left off last time uh, and, and remind you that's what we are doing. I mean, we are, we are making data linearly separable. Uh, and this was the idea of using kernels. So the data looks like this. You can see that uh, it's impossible to use a linear, a linear separator in the x1, x2 space to distinguish green from blue. And what we are doing is we are changing, we are transforming the space. In this case, we are transforming it to an x1 square, x2 square space. And in this space, uh, you can separate green and blue. That's, that's all the, there is to it, but technically it's a little bit more involved. So I wanna remind you where we are. We gave examples for a few kernels, and I wanna uh, start here. Okay, so uh, basically the idea is uh, what we showed by going through this uh, uh, perceptron or dual perceptron, we show that we can compute the function that we care about, f of x. Oh, thanks. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll stay with this until the battery runs off and tell me when it runs off. Uh, we show that f of x, the prediction on a point x, can be computed as a function of dot product in the feature space. Um, the problem is that if we blow up the feature space, computing this dot product is gonna take a long time because it's gonna be high dimension. So um, the idea is that the kernel trick is compute dot product in a very high dimension without actually touching the high dimensional data points. So here is an example where my original data points are x and y and dimensional points here, y and x. I'm, I wanna blow up the dimensionality in this case to the quadratic dimensionality, kind of like in the picture that I showed before. That is, my phi here, the transformation of x1 to xn is gonna be this. It's an n dimension, in fact, it's all dimensions until two, right? So it's one, x1 up to xn, all the squares and the mixed squares. So this is about n square dimensions instead of n dimensions, okay? So if n was 100, now you have, uh, 10,000. If it was 1,000, you have a million. Uh, and I want to compute the dot product between phi of x and phi of y. That's going to take me time because it's a function of the dimensionality. Instead, I'm arguing here that I don't need to do it. I can just stay with x1 up to xn and y1 up to xn, do the dot product, add one, now I have a number right, and square this number. So the dot product phi of x, phi of y I denoted by A, this new number I'm denoting by B, and my claim is that A is equal to B, which means if you want to compute dot product in high dimensions, it's okay to do it instead by computing in the low dimension. And this is uh, what the kernel trick is. So if you want to convince yourself that that's true, just take this and do a little bit of algebra and convince yourself. That's actually what we did here, where I'm spelling this out loud. You want to work with two degree polynomials, uh, polynomial features phi of x. This is what we did before. Then your dot product will be in the space of n square. 
The kernel trick that allows you to save and compute that product in an n-dimensional space. And um, now the question is, can you always do this? Can any k function of x and y uh, can work here? And the answer is no. Um, in order for k to be a valid candidate or a valid kernel trick, uh, this k of xz has to correspond to a dot product. And we gave this example. This is also quadratic, but it's slightly different quadratic, right? I don't have the one here. Right? So if you look here, it's just the dot product in the original space square before I had one plus the dot product all square. If I have it this way, I only carry with me quadratic terms. If I have the one there, I actually have all the degrees up to two, which means constant one, degree one, and degree two. But this is also a kernel. And to see that it's a kernel, I'm giving here a two-dimensional example. So n here is two. You don't see the value of it when n is two because the phi become size three. Uh, but as I said, if n was 100, you would see the value. And again, I compute k of xz here. It's the dot product square. And here I'm going the other direction, right? So before, in the previous slide, I told you this is the phi. You want to compute this, instead compute that. Now I'm doing it in the other direction. So I want to compute this, which means I want to compute the first row here. And I figured out that if I write it as a dot product of this times this, dot product of three-dimensional space vectors, I'm going to get the same answer. OK? So these are two ways to say the same thing. We want to compute the dot product in a high dimensional space. We are doing it without touching the high dimensional space. Yes? So the example we did was working with x squared, but we don't necessarily know that that will solve the problem. So are there any other problems? Oh, so how do I know which kernel to use? You don't. Uh, so uh, basically, it's feature engineering job. So, so you, you have data. You try to run a linear separator on it, your linear learning algorithm, your favorite linear algorithm. If you see that you don't fit the data well, even in training, you get low results. You say, OK, I'm not expressive enough. Let's blow up the feature space. Let's use quadratic kernels and see what happens then. You're not happy? use other kernels, and so on. So there's really no magic here. Uh, later today, we're going to start talking about theory, and we'll see that this is actually a sensible way to do, because as you increase the expressivity of your feature space, uh, it's going to cost you something. You don't want to do it. You don't want to go all the way to very, very expressive feature space, because everything complexity-wise is going to cost you. So you want to try it step by step. Yeah, yeah, so, so we're going to touch upon it. So, um, OK, so, so as I said, we cannot use any k. Some k's um, hold, and the property is this, what I'm writing here. A function is a valid kernel if it corresponds to a dot product. Now, later on, I gave you, um, now there is, there is a more general condition that I don't want to dwell on. You can look at the next slides. I skipped over them here, but they're in the, in the deck. Uh, I'm giving you a bunch of kernels. The first one is just the linear kernel, just the dot product, which means you're not blowing up the feature space. The second one is the polynomial kernel we just talked about. You can do it to the power of 2, as we saw, but you can do it to the power of d. The third one is another polynomial kernel only with a constant here, which means it gives me all degrees up to d. Uh, and you can check that all these are kernels just from the definition. And then I gave a few other transformations. I'm not going to dwell on it now, but 
you should be able to take, for example, this guy here and prove to yourself, convince to yourself that this is indeed a kernel. You know that k is a kernel, which means there is a transformation phi such that k of x x prime is phi of x dot product phi of x prime. And then convince yourself that also c times this is a dot product. And the same thing you can do for all this. So there's a bunch of transformation. I'm not going to go over it. I want to go over this one. This is an important kernel that often works. So this would be something to try, maybe the first thing to try before you even try polynomial kernel. And this is called Gaussian kernel or RBF for radial based functions. Uh, this is how it's defined. K of xz is e to the power of x minus z to the power of 2 over c uh, minus this. So, so if you think a little bit about it, let's assume that c is 1. Um, what you will get is that if x and z are about the same, you have e to the power of 0, which is 1. So regardless of x and z, if they are the same, you get a fixed number. If x and z are very far away, x minus z e is very large, e to the minus something very large, it's going to be close to zero. Which means you'll get a picture something like this. Around x, x is the one that we care about now. You get close points have a high value to the kernel, farther point have a low value. Now you can still parameterize it by c here, that's why it's to the power of 2 over c. And if you think a little bit about it, you'll convince yourself that if c is very, very small, actually you'll get a constant there. If c is very large, you'll get just diagonal. Just when x is equal to z, you get something. So this is an important kernel. Again, you can convince yourself that this is a kernel uh, just by doing the basic operators that I showed before, the basic transformations um, from, uh, this is how it's defined. And here I'm just doing a little bit of algebra. And at the end, I'm getting to um, some function of x, this e to the xz over sigma square, some function of, the same function of z. Um, and I'm arguing that this is a kernel. So this is perhaps the most important kernel uh, that you want to use. It's kind of a general purpose kernel, works um, often. Okay, so, so where are we? Uh, so, so again, when you go back over it, try to convince yourself that you understand what a kernel is and that if I give you one kernel, you can generate from it other kernels uh, using this transformation. So, so basically, what we talked about is a method to run perceptron. The same thing is going to work on very large, on, on other algorithms, uh, on a very large feature set without actually incurring the cost of keeping a very large weight vector. Okay, that's, that's the bottom line. Now, uh, because we showed that we can compute the weight vector in the original uh, feature space. Um, Again, I said this before and it's important. This is really about efficiency. It's not going to change the classifier that you learn. Uh, sometimes this is not clear in the literature, but uh, hopefully the transformation that we've done with perceptron shows that. You know, it's really the same uh, algorithm. Uh, the generalization is still relative to the true dimensionality. So if you use a quadratic kernel, you move from n to n squared dimensionality. Whatever generalization theory that you have that depends on the dimensionality, you're going to suffer from the n squared dimensionality. Okay, so, and as I said, uh, kernel became popular uh, by SVMs, and we're going to go and back and mention it when we touch SVMs, but really they apply to a large range of models, perceptrons, as we showed, Gaussian models, PCAs, 
uh, that we're going to touch upon at the end of the class and, and, and more. Okay, so, so just as a final comment, one question is, do I always want to use kernels? So let's assume that you are in a regime where you need to blow up your feature space. You have this green-blue <coughs> example that I showed before, and you want to separate data that is not linearly separable. So now you have two options. One option is to define explicitly more features, conjunctive features, like those that you define in homework two, for example, or use a kernel, which I like to think about as explicit kernel or implicit kernel. In both cases, you blow up the feature space. Which one is better? So really the issue is um, something about the properties of the data. So let's do some back of the envelope computation here and see, see what happens. So let's assume that M is the number of examples I have. And T1 and T2 uh, are the sizes of the feature spaces. T1 is the dual space, the large one. T2 is the primal space, the original one, the small one. Um, so if I'm running the standard perceptron, it's going to cost me so a lot of you like to eat uh, during class, which is okay with me, but please quiet, okay? Uh, because I think it bothers many people uh, and me. So uh, what happens when you run through the, the primal space? I have T2 features. I have M examples. The number of operations that I'm running is about T2 times M. Right, so I have a dot product, which is linear, a function of T2. I do it M time for all my examples, so it's T2 M. Everyone agrees? Just think about what happens when you run Perceptron. For every example, you do a dot product, which is a function linear in T2. What happens when I'm running in the dual space? I don't have a weight vector. Instead, I kept all the previous examples. Maybe not all of them, maybe just half of them. Those on which I made mistakes, but let's assume that it's M. Uh, so for each example, I'm touching all M examples, which means I'm quadratic, right? So for each example, I touch, I'm touching all the other examples. So what? So my, the cost is going to be pretty much T1 times M squared. Everyone agrees here? Why is it M squared? Questions? Okay, so basically what I need to, com to compare between is between T1 M squared in the dual space and T2 M. Now, typically T1 is going to be much smaller than T2. Sorry, that, that's the other way around. T2 is going to be much smaller. Oh, wow. T2. Is going to be much smaller than T1. Everyone agrees with this? Okay, so really it boils down to the number of examples one needs to consider relative to the growth in the dimensionality. Yes? Okay, okay, just a second, let's see. Am I... Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right, sorry. So it was correct, I don't know why. Let's see if we are happy now. T1 is the dual space. Yes, sorry. Thanks. Uh, T1 is much smaller than T2. That's the dual space. Uh, so it boils down to the number of examples that we need to consider. 
So basically the rule of thumb is, if you have a lot of examples, work in the primal space. If you have a small number of examples, okay to work in the dual space. And, and again, this ratio between T1 and T2 relative to M, the number of examples, is really what dictates what you want to do. Questions? Yes. So, so the dual space, in, when you are in the dual space, you are doing dot product over the original, the end I mentioned, right? When you are working in the primal space, you blew up first the feature space. Now say you have n square features. And you do linearly, linear number of operations in that space. So by primal, you mean after it's been expected? Yes, yes. Okay. Because I want to be, I want to do the same thing. So my option are, I'm doing dot product in the dual space that kept the original dimensionality n or I blow up the feature space and I work in the primal, just running the standard perceptron. Okay, so T2 will be something like N square if I'm doing polynomial of degree two, and T1 is gonna be N. So now you have to compare this relative to how many examples you have and the side. Okay, so, so that's one uh, important thing. Very similar to this, you can ask yourself the question, um, do I want to use the most expressive kernels? So I know that linear kernels, that is no kernels, are not going to be sufficient for me. Maybe I, sh I should just go directly to polynomials of degree 100. Uh, or to all monomials, which is the example we started with. Uh, the answer is no. And again, I'm not gonna go into the details, but, but the intuition is it's equivalent to working in a very, very expressive function space. I don't wanna work in a very expressive function space. So I wanna work in as expressive as needed, but no more than that. So if you go to the slides, you'll see a little bit of an argument following these slides that discusses this, but Immediately after this, we're gonna start talking about learning theory and we'll get other arguments for why that is. Again, the argument is no, because I don't wanna to be too expressive. I don't wanna, in the terminology of, of uh, homework one, I don't wanna use the full-fledged decision trees. It's gonna to be too expressive. I wanna limit my expressivity somehow and it's equivalent to don't use the most expressive kernels. Okay, summarizing, uh, kernels is really an important idea. Uh, even if you don't want to use it ex explicitly, and uh, implicitly, but you wanna use explicit blowing up of the feature space. Um, basically, uh, it pushes the idea that we often want to be able to move or to transform our data to a more expressive feature space. Uh, it's important because it affects generalizations. We have to understand this, you know. You move to a more expressive space. Um, but uh, again, it's, it's a crucial idea, and not only in simple classification. So when you deal with classifying other structure, for example, if you want to deal with parse trees, your data is going to be sentences transformed to parse trees, and you can define uh, kernels over pastries. You can define you can define kernels over graphs. Basically, this is a way, a general way, to define a collection of expressive features over the type of input that we we have. So again, I'm not going to give details on this. If people will be interested, um, that will be uh, a good place to start to look for it. Okay, so. Uh, Questions on this? Okay, so let's move on to the next uh, part. And I wanna start with some reminders. So 
first of all, midterm next uh, next Wednesday in class. So it's 75 minutes. Closed books. You don't need anything. We'll give you at the end of the exam, you know, a few formulas uh, in case you need it. But please leave everything uh, on the side. We already left a few examples of previous midterms on the website. Please look at look at it. Uh, it's going to cover everything we've done until uh, next Monday of the lecture before. Um, go to the recitations uh, because we're going to cover uh, <coughs> the, the exams. Yes? Are we allowed to use calculators? You don't need to. You're allowed to use calculators, but you don't need calculators. Uh, so if there's going to be some math to do, it will be simple fractions, s s s arithmetic. It will be easier to do, you know, two thirds times two thirds uh, by in your head. So, um, okay, that's one. Uh, homework two, due on Wednesday. Uh, please check the Piazza posts. I know that many of you have, but if you haven't, so there are two Piazza points related to efficiency. They are both pinged, so they'll be in the top, I don't know, three, four, five. Uh, about efficiency of average perceptron, check it out. You, unless you figured it out yourself, you may need uh, these hints. Go to office hours. Uh, questions? No questions. I hear a question somewhere there, but uh, no questions. OK, so let's move on. And before that, I want to say one thing about the projects. Project proposal are due this Friday. I got a few requests, but not uh, an overwhelming number of, of questions. So I'm hoping you're all working on it, thinking <coughs> about it. Um, in the slides, this one, and I showed it already earlier, I gave a few ideas. Uh, the proposal has to be short, ideally one page, but you already have to know something about what you're doing, specifically some preliminary ideas at least, and some literature. So it's essential that you, you know what has happened in this area and you've read a couple of papers or at least identified a few papers and you'll read them um, as, you, as you work. Questions on that? Okay. Uh, so so let's, let's move on. So, so where are we? So we talked about algorithms. We talked about um, models uh, and what we haven't talked about yet is about generalization. So we're really at a stage now that we have enough algorithmic um, abilities and we want to think about generalization. So uh, one, one uh, thing that this will give us, as we will see, is basically improvements to existing algorithms and some understanding of existing algorithms. The theory is going to be general. It's going to apply to everything we've seen from decision trees to SGD, all the linear classifier through neural networks and through probabilistic learning. The theory is gonna be general enough to actually carry everything that is being done in learning or provide understanding of generalization to everything that is happening uh, in machine learning. Uh, so so that's, that's what we want to be able to do now to provide some guarantees uh, to what are we doing here? I mean, how do we know that what we're doing makes sense? So, so really, uh, the theory, which we call computational learning theory, uh, asks, are there any general laws that constrain inductive learning, that could guide inductive learning? Are there any learning problems that we cannot solve? <coughs> how can we uh, even think about it? When can we trust? The, the output of the learning algorithm. Uh, so basically, the theory should relate probability of successful learning, number of training examples that are needed, complexity of hypothesis space, 
uh, accuracy to which the target concept can be approximated, um, and also the protocol, the manner in which training examples are presented. So we're going to say things about the top four things, not so much about the last one, because we're going to take one protocol of learning um, for granted, at least in the discussion here. Okay, so, so recall what we did before. We talked already about quantifying performance, uh, and at that time, we talked about, we had some hidden conjunction. That was a running example. And we looked at three learning protocols. And we said, okay, as a function of the learning protocol, we can argue about the number of examples needed, in this case, 100, the number of examples needed here in the teaching scenario, only six. And then we got to the more commonly studied learning protocol, kind of the random source of examples. And we could not talk about the number of examples. Instead, we talked about the number of mistakes. We just didn't know when the mistakes are going to happen. Uh, we gave an algorithm that I call the elimination algorithm. And we ended up with this final hypothesis, which we were not so happy with because uh, it wasn't right, right? X1, we knew, is not part of the true function. It's written at the top right there. But we couldn't eliminate it. We didn't have data that would eliminate it. And then we said, OK, now we have two directions that we can proceed from this understanding. We can either think about mistake-driven learning algorithms, those algorithms that up update the hypothesis only when you make a mistake. Uh, and you know this is uh, one good way to analyze and study learning algorithms. And the second direction is to take this probabilistic intuition that we discussed when we saw that x, y, X1 did not disappear. The intuition there was, well, I've seen a lot of examples. X1 was not eliminated, right? So it was never on uh, in a negative example, right? Remember, it was a conjunction. So if something is on in a negative example, I know it's not needed, uh, and I'm eliminating it. So I never eliminated it. Maybe it's OK. Maybe because it never bothered me during training, it will never bother me. Or the probability that it will bother me during test is very small. So I will not make a lot of mistakes. Uh, and we're fine. So this probabilistic intuition is what is called the PEC framework, or guides the PEC framework for probably approximately correct. And this is what I want to be able to, to develop today. So let's, let's, uh, let's start and remind ourselves what we're talking about. So we have an instance space, x. This is something that should be uh, trivial now. We have a concept space, which is the set of all target functions, c. Uh, we have a hypothesis space, which is the set of functions, our algorithm can deal with, can learn, uh, can produce. Now, H and C could be the same, may not be the same. C might not exist. It could be an imaginary one. But this is where I'm thinking the target functions are. But H is, is the realistic one. This is what my algorithm plays with. And then I have a collection of training examples. Uh, that uh, data set cross 0, 1 in this case, positive and negative examples. OK, so uh, under these settings, my goal is to find h such that h of x is equal to f of x. Uh, but there are some quantifiers. Do I want h of x to be equal to f of x for all x in S, my training data? We agree that this is uninteresting. That's easy to do. 
Really what I want is I want it for all x in x, all instance space, which we cannot do. Um, so, so now I'm going to add an assumption. And the assumption is going to be, I'm going to assume that the training instances are generated by a fixed but unknown probability distribution d over x, or x cross 0, 1, say. And then my goal is going to be to determine h that estimates f uh, evaluated by a set of instances that is also sampled according to d. So what is my assumption here? My assumption is that there is some probability distribution. We don't know what it is. It governs the generation of my training instances. But it's also going to govern, govern the generation of my test instances. This, this actually pertains to a few examples that you asked at various points earlier in the semester. What if I see outliers in the training? What if I see this in the test? So, we are assuming that there is some probability distribution and that what we've seen in the training is sampled from the same distribution as what we'll see in the future. Right, so if this is your space, your instance space, and your training, you see everything from this corner of the space. And in evaluation, you see everything from that corner. I may not be able to give you any guarantees, which has to make sense some intuitive level of this. So this is going to be an assumption that we're going to call the distribution-free assumption. Uh, and under the, this assumption, we're going to continue now and do this analysis of the missing x1 or the existing x1. So here is the intuition of, of this model. Uh, we've seen a lot of examples according to, drawn according to D. Since all the positive examples, so since in all the positive example x1 was active, therefore I, I never eliminated it, it's very likely that it will be active in the future in positive examples. Right? That's the D, uh, the, the consistency of D assumption. If not, the probability that x1 is going to be active uh, and, and therefore cause errors for us is going to be very small. The error, which I'm measuring here as the probability over this probability distribution D, that f of x is different than h of x, is going to be small. So this is the picture that, that I, uh, I want to show. So the, the big rectangle is my instance space. These are all the examples. F is the blue circle, where my assumption is here, or my notation is that everything inside are positive examples of F. Everything outside the blue circle are negative examples of F. H is the red circle. Everything inside the red circle are positive examples of H. Everything outside are negative examples of H. So, so error means uh, looking at the symmetric difference between H and F. Those examples that H thinks are positive. Uh, when I'm moving my mouse, yeah, you can see it. H things are positive and F things are negative, or F things are positive and H things are negative. Okay? Now, let's go back to, to this conjunction. Is the picture that I give here a realistic picture given that we are talking about these conjunctions? Yeah? No, because it's dimensional. Um, our dimension is uh, exponential. True, so that's one problem, but. I don't know how to draw six dimensions, so give, give me that. It's everything is two dimensions, but still inside the circle are positive examples of F, which is the target conjunction. Remember that the target conjunction was X2 and X3 and X4 and X5 and X100. 
that's the blue, and H is my hypothesis, which is this. So modulo the dimensionality thing, which there's nothing I can do. Is there another reason you would complain that I'm wrong here? Yeah? What do you mean there are no negative examples? So I think what you were saying, so that is, um, <clears throat> you're saying that like x is always active when x is positive, or just based on what you've seen, um, there should be some cases of the x being very few um, when x is negative um, when uh, x1 is active. <clears throat> Okay, so I think you're going in the right direction. Uh, I just want someone to try to say it in a slightly different way. Yeah? So I think in this example, x1 is not supposed to be here, right? So that means that you're going to be wrong on like, half of the examples. So there should be a lot of negatives in each of the So there will be examples that are negative four for H. for H, but not for F. Negative for H, but not for F, which means here. Give me an example that is negative for H, but positive for F. Right. So, so you gave me an example where that is here, right? That F is positive for, but H is negative for. Everyone agrees? So let's assume all are ones, right? Including X1, and of course, two, three, four, five, and 100. I don't care about the others. That will be a positive example uh, for F but will be negative. Sorry, I think we, we got it wrong. We, we, it, we, want, we, want H to be, we want X1 to be zero, right? X1 is zero, the rest are ones. Then it will be positive for F, so it will be in the blue, but it will be negative for H, right? If X1 is one, if X1 is zero, then it's negative for H. Everyone agrees? So we have some points here. What about here? Yes? So there is no example, you argue, that is positive for H but negative for F. Think about it. No example that is in this region, positive for H and negative for F. And the reason is that we learn monotone conjunctions. And, and H is, has more variables than F, right? So really, the set of positive examples of H is smaller, right? So this is just for this specific case. It's not a general case. This is the general case. But I want you to think about it and convince yourself so that you kind of understand what's happening here in terms of disagreement between F and H. And I'm going to use this now when I'm giving you a bound on the error that uh, these learning algorithms can make. So uh, I'm going to bound the error given what I know about the training instances, which is really what we want, right? So you want to have, here are my training instances. As a function of them, tell me, once I'm done learning, what's going to be my future error? So really, the picture you agreed is this, right? It's asymmetric. And I want to be able to analyze uh, as a function of the M examples I've seen, what's going to be the probability of making a mistake in the future. So how much will x1 bother me, basically? Right? That's, that's what I'm answering. 
So, so let's, let's do a little bit of uh, probability here. Not too difficult, but I think uh, we'll clarify things. So, so let's assume that z is a literal, a variable. Think about x1 if you want. Let p of z be the probability that when I sample data according to my d distribution, uh, z is positive, the, the example is positive, but z is false in it. Okay? This is exactly the source of error that I have. Agreed? If I have a positive example, but x1 is going to be zero in it, I'm going to say a negative example, but it's actually a positive example. With h, I'm going to say false, but actually it's a true example. So this is the only source of error that I have. These that behave this way, that they are false in a positive example, are the source of error. Everyone agrees? And therefore, the error that I'm going to have is bounded by the sum of all p's of z's over all z's that, a, that are in h. Right? So, so look at the, the variable that remain in h. Each one of them could be a source of error if it shouldn't be there. We know that it's only x1 because I told you the truth. But in principle, each one of them could be a source of error if it wasn't really there. Now, it could be that they never come separately. I mean, whenever one of them is, is, a, is false, all of them are false or something like this because of the, the weird distribution. But worst case is that these bad guys will bother me one at a time. And therefore, the error that I will make is bounded by the sum of the P, P of Z's over all Z's in H. OK? Now, just to make sure that we are on the same page, remember that this P of Z during learning, before I got the H, was exactly the probability that a randomly chosen example was positive, and Z was deleted from it, right? Because during learning, when something like this happened, I said, OK, Z doesn't matter. Remember? We eliminated it. OK, so now that we agree on that, and another uh, source of uh, agreement should be, if Z is really there, should be there, like x4, p of z is 0. Right? It will never be false in a positive example. Agreed? OK, so with this together, now I can say that h will make mistakes only on positive examples. I think you knew that. But I'm just saying it again. And here is why. A mistake is made only if z that is in h but not in f is false in a positive example. In this case, h is going to say no, but really the example is positive. So this is the discussion that we had before. You should agree with it. And therefore, p of z is also the probability that d causes h to make a mistake on a randomly drawn examples. Now, as I said before, there could be overlapping reasons for mistakes. But the sum clearly bounds it. OK, so, so now that we agree on that, um, Let's assume that I learned z stay there. Uh, and I want to know, OK, so what will happen? How much of a problem will the fact that z stay there is going to cause me in future examples? So I'm going to call z bad if the probability of z is large enough, greater than epsilon over n, where epsilon is going to be some error parameter that we'll set later. Why do I, again, why do I care about it? So I already learned Z was not eliminated during learning. And I want to know, uh, so what will happen eventually? If P of Z is very large, when I see test examples, it's going to bother me. So, I'm, so if P is greater than this epsilon over N, I'm going to say that Z is bad. A bad literal is one that is not in the target 
a concept, has a significant probability to appear false in a po uh, positive example, but nevertheless, I did not eliminate it. So, first claim is, if there are no bad literals, my error is less than epsilon. And the reason is that the error I said is the sum of all p's of z's over less than n things. Each one of them is epsilon over n, so it's less than epsilon altogether. What if there are bad literals? Uh, let's assume that z is 1. What is the probability that it was not eliminated in the first example that I saw? It's 1 minus the probability that it's eliminated, which means it's 1 minus p of z. Okay? What's the probability that I see m examples, the examples are independent of each other, and I never eliminated this z? Think about the x1 case, right? So I saw many examples, x1 survived them. So it's this 1 minus p of z to the power m, right? Okay, so that's the probability that x1 or z survived m examples. What do I want? I want this probability to be small, but this is for x1. There could be many literals like x1 up to n like this, so the probability that some bad literal survives is n times this. So n times 1 minus epsilon over n to the m. So that's, that's the worst case that uh, can happen. Now, what do I want? Um, I want this, oh, come on, okay. I want this bad event that I did not eliminate someone, uh, but it's still a bad one, to, to have low probability. So I want it to be, uh, I want such a probability that some z survives as an example to be less than delta, another parameter that you will choose. Eventually you'll choose epsilon to be, say, 0.1 and delta to be 0.1. So that's what I want, right? So I want the probability that z survives an example, which is this, to be less than delta. Uh, now, here is some uh, fact that you probably have seen. If you haven't seen, now you see it. Inequality. It's always true when x is positive that 1 minus x is less than e to the minus x. Um, and therefore, when I have here 1 minus x, uh, I can replace it by e to the minus x. Okay, my x here is epsilon over n. So I'm replacing it, and, and therefore, if I want this to happen, it's sufficient to require that n times e to the minus m times epsilon over n, m comes from here, is less than delta. The reason I did this is because this way it's easier for me to isolate m. What I want to know is a condition on m. How many examples do I need to see so that everything is going to be okay? So now that I have this, I can isolate m from here. You can do this as, a, as an exercise. Just take log based, uh, natural log on both sides, and you'll get this. So m has to be larger than something that is inversely proportional in epsilon, proportional to n, and inversely proportional to, to delta, in fact, to ln delta, which all should make sense to you. So if you want epsilon to be tiny, small error, you're going to have to see more examples. If you want delta, the confidence within which you know that no bad things could have happened, you're going to pay by seeing more examples. So hopefully, the, the dependence here uh, make sense. So if I see these many examples, I know that the probability of failure 
that is my error is going to be less than, more than epsilon, is going to be small. Now you can um, rephrase this in the following way. We prove the theorem. If m is as above, with probability at least one minus delta, there are no bad literals. Nothing, no x1 survived when I looked at m examples. Now, it's just with some probability, with probability greater than one over delta. Or equivalently, I can say, if m is as above, with probability at least one minus delta, the error that I will see, that I will make in the future using my hypothesis is less than epsilon. Questions? Okay, I plugged in some numbers here, uh, just to give you an idea. If n is 100, and I take epsilon and delta to be 0.1, I need almost 7,000 examples. Seems too much. Just a small conjunction, right? Um, on the other hand, uh, if n is 10, all I need is just 460. So you can see the dependence also on n. If I change delta by a factor of 10, it doesn't change a lot because it depends really here on the log of delta. But anyhow, this is an upper bound, of course. Maybe you'll do everything with a lot less examples, but it gives you an idea that now we have some rules that allow us to, or some theory that allow us to say, if you see enough examples, enough in terms of how good you want to be in the future, everything is going to be fine. Okay, so, so what are we doing here? So, so really, I'm stepping one step aside and I'm going to go back to these arguments a little bit uh, in a few minutes. So uh, I have a prediction theory now. I have an instance space, I have a classifier. I'm making prediction with this H from X to Y. I have an unknown distribution over X cross Y. Uh, I have a set of examples of size M which is my training data. And uh, now I'm defining the true error. That's what I really care about. The true error is the probability over the distribution D that H of X is different than Y, is wrong. Uh, and I'm also defining the empirical error, which is the probability in S that H is different than Y. Okay, that we can measure. And, and what I want is really to relate these two, right? So um, with this definition, I can ask the question, can we describe or bound error D given error S? Right? That's really what we care about. Now, in my case, I made one more assumption. I assume that there is a function space C that is the set of all possible target functions. Uh, and H was the set of possible hypotheses. And this allows me to ask another question, which is, is C learnable? Is it possible to find an algorithm that error D will behave nicely uh, when my target is C and my hypothesis space is H? Um, so, now, at the beginning here, in uh, my analysis, I'm going to assume that the empirical error is zero. That is, actually during training, we have no errors, right? We're completely consistent, which is a little bit unrealistic, but it's going to be easy to deal with, and then we'll see that everything goes the same if you also have a little bit of error. So remember now when we learned conjunctions, we did the elimination algorithm, and on our training data, we had no errors, right? We, we fixed the hypothesis so that it would be completely consistent with the training data. And that's how I did the analysis now. I assumed that everything was perfect on the training, and I ask, what's the probability that I'll make an error uh, in the future? 
And that's what we are going to continue to do now. But, but basically, hopefully it gave us now an idea of how to think about uh, learning. So we cannot really expect the learning to learn the concept exactly because that's something we said from the beginning. In principle, there are going to be many concepts that are consistent with, with the data. Uh, and unseen examples, future example, could potentially have any label. So really, we have to agree to misclassify uncommon examples that do not show up in the training set, or they are not representative of this. So we cannot, so that's one thing. We have to uh, agree that we're going to incur some errors. Also, we cannot always expect to learn a close approximation of the target because sometimes the training data that someone gives us is not typical. Right? So again, think about this as your instance space. In the test data, you will see only examples from this region. But if in the training they did not give you examples from here, they gave you other examples, you, you cannot expect that uh, you learn a good concept. So your training set is not representative uh, of what you care about. Therefore, the only realistic expectation of a good learner is that with high probability, it will learn a close approximation of the target concept. So these are the two things we're playing. Close approximation means epsilon, error. It's a close approximation, but not perfect. So that's the error we're going to make. But it's not certain that we're going to get a close approximation. Because, as I said, maybe people did not give you good training data. This is the with high probability. And, and these are the two parameters. And this is what we're going to call a uh, probably approximately correct, so, which is this. So the approximately correct is the epsilon, probably is the delta. So I'm basically saying just what we said before. Uh, and the definition is, or we are getting to the definition, in probably approximately correct learning, one requires that given a small set of small parameters, epsilon and data, epsilon and delta, Epsilon is the error. Delta is the probability within which we're going to be good, uh, we're going to be bad. Uh, with probability at least 1 minus delta, the learner gives us a hypothesis that has error at most epsilon. Uh, and really, the reason we can hope for this is this consistent distribution assumption, right? The fact that we are assuming that there is some fixed distribution unknown to us that governs the generation of training data and will govern the, generator, the generation of data later on. OK, questions. I'm sure you have questions. OK, so let's, let's, let's define this formally. So I'm considering a concept class define over instance space X, uh, and I have a learner L that makes use of the hypothesis space H. I'm going to say that C, the class of all functions, is spec learnable. So notice that there is no notion of this function is learnable. If you know the function, you have it. The problem is that you have a huge number of functions. You know that the hidden function is there, and the question is, if you see data, can you learn functions in this class? So I'm going to say that the class C is fact learnable by L using H if for all functions in C, for all distributions D over X, for some fixed epsilon and delta, small epsilon and delta, um, that are positive and less than 1, the algorithm L, given a collection of M examples, sampled independently according to D, produces with high probability, at least 1 minus delta, a hypothesis that has small error uh, when it sees 
m examples. And I want m also to be polynomial. Everything has to be polynomial in computer science. And polynomial in the reasonable complexity parameter, which is 1 over epsilon, 1 over delta, n, and the size of h. So, so uh, before we continue here, let's see if this makes sense. So it's clear, as I said before, when we develop the bound for conjunction, that if you want epsilon to be very, very small, you're going to pay with larger m. Right? So it makes sense that m depends on 1 over epsilon. But I want the dependence to be polynomial. Similarly, for 1 over delta, if you want to be very, very certain that you have a pretty good hypothesis, that is delta is tiny, you're going to pay with more examples. The number of features is going to factor in n. And the size of h is also going to factor in, because if h is huge, it's going to be very easy to find a hypothesis there uh, that will be consistent with the data, but it will affect your generalization. So it makes sense that all these are complexity parameters. So that's learnability. I didn't talk about efficiency. I just talked about sample complexity, if you want. How large should the number of examples m be so that things are going to be good? In addition, you can say, I want C to be efficiently learnable. That is, I want L to be uh, an efficient learning algorithm, so it will produce the hypothesis also in time that is polynomial in the same parameters. OK? OK, so, so really we impose two limitations in the definition. One is sample complexity. You can think about it as an information theoretic constraints. Do we have enough information in the sample, the m examples, to distinguish h from, uh, from other functions and approximate f? And the second one is the time complexity. Is there an efficient algorithm that can do it? So uh, to be now notice that the way I've written it, uh, You want to want to say something to all of us, because I can hear you saying something, but I can't really hear what you say. Yeah. So, so to be pack learnable, the way I define it, uh, there must be a hypothesis in H that has small error for every f. Right? If if H doesn't even exist. Uh, then there's no hope. So in this case, I'm, I have to assume that h is larger than c. Right? So this is the space of all the functions that are hidden for me. h must be larger than this, because I want every f inside f, inside c, to be expressed via functions in h. OK? Otherwise, there's just no hope. Uh, and we call this um, properly text learnable if, if they are the same. If basically the set of functions I'm after and the set of hypotheses I'm using is the same function. Uh, OK, so notice that this is, so another comment here is that it's, it's a worst case definition, right? I want it to be for every distribution, right? Every distribution over the data. I want to be able to have an algorithm. So you could say, well, this is too much to hope for. Maybe for some distributions uh, over the data I can learn, and for some very bad distribution I cannot learn. We'll see later on that this is actually an important assumption. The second worst case is that I want it to be true for every target function, f in c. And again, you can say, you know, maybe only for some of them. But basically, that means that you're restricting C. So choose whatever C you want. And for this C, we are going to uh, have uh, for all. OK, so, so I want to finish with this claim. And I want you to think about it at home and convince yourself that you actually know how to prove it, because it's what we said before. 
What is the claim? What are we arguing here? What I want to say is that the probability, and this is a general thing. It's not only for conjunction. It's going to be general for learning. It's something, it's the Occam's razor that we talked about maybe in the first lecture. The idea that I want my hypothesis spaces to be small. And if I find something that is good within a small hypothesis space, I have a better chance of generalization. So here is how we can now formulate it. The probability that there exists a hypothesis that, one, it's consistent with M examples. OK, my learning algorithm finds something that made no mistakes on my M examples. And at the same time, its error is large, greater than epsilon. What do you want me to say now? Is the probability large, small? What do we want here? So, uh, so I want to be able to show that the probability that um, these two things happen together is small as a function of m, right? If I'm consistent with m examples, and nevertheless, I'm making a lot of error, shouldn't happen. Right? That's basically what I showed before for the conjunction. So I eliminated all the variables. So I was consistent with my M examples. And I wanted to show that the probability that x1 is not going to be such a destruction that I will make a lot of error because of it. Right? That's basically was, and the same thing we're going to prove here, right? So we're going to prove that the probability that this happens is going to be bounded by, as a function of m, the number of examples, and the size of the hypothesis. Now we're going to deal with size of hypothesis because it's going to be more general. Earlier today, we just talked about conjunction, so we didn't, we just have n as the size, really. So that's where we're going to start next time. Final questions. Okay, we're going to continue with this on Wednesday. Is it too late to petition to switch to 519? You want to do a project? Yeah, because I recently realized that I want, I think I want to submit into a master's and I was going on the website and it said that 419 doesn't count as a cross list for 519. So I'd have to do the project. Yeah, but it means it. that you have just a few days oh, to, get to a find project. a team and, and write oh, yeah, a proposal. I, I emailed someone yesterday and it seems like they'd be interested in working together. That's fine. So you can petition. Uh, I, I wrote actually on one of the previous slides how to do this. You have to talk to someone in the academic office. I can't remember whom. If you go over one of the previous okay. uh, slide decks, you'll see it. It's either Nick or, or someone else in the office there. Okay, I'm just talking to them. And, and, then and tell them that you want a petition. And you have to fill a form. And maybe I don't even need to sign it. I think I think you can do it with them. If work is, bring it on Wednesday and I'll sign it. Okay, good. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, 
I don't know. It, it, it will be close to it. I can't guarantee it will be exactly the same.
Yeah. <laughs>